So I'm Tim Leahy. I'm the project leader for the curriculum redesign, and I'm going to make some brief remarks in the, in the beginning and uh, introduce the leadership of the redesign and then spend the bulk of the time just talking about what you want to talk about. I want to make sure that this is flexible and not us just uh, coming at you with a lot of information. I want it to go back and forth. So one, why are we doing the curriculum redesign? About 100 years ago, when Abraham Flexner designed the modern medical curriculum, medical practice, as you know, is incredibly different from the way it is now. And now, uh, our graduates are practicing in interprofessional, team-based environments, interacting with lots of different specialties, using technologies with a wealth of information at their fingertips that we didn't have 50 years ago. What practice is is entirely different, and, and medical education needs to adapt to that change. We um, have learned also about just what effective medical education looks like. The data on medical education has been emerging and new ways of engaging students more than lectures and sort of really getting them to remember the messages we're getting across are, are things we want to make sure that we take full advantage of. And in response to these changes, the Liaison Committee for Medical Education, which oversees all curricula and you know, requires what ours is supposed to look like within boundaries, has changed their requirements. And uh, we need to make sure that we keep within those regulations. Fortunately, we have an excellent medical school and a dedicated faculty. And so with the arrival of uh, Dean Shoba, we've had a catalyst to uh, take this to the next level, not because we needed to import a whole bunch of new talent. We had it. We just needed the impetus to get going. Um, what have we done so far? This is uh, not the beginning of the process, as I'll show you. Our uh, funding began uh, fairly recently, but, uh, but uh, we've been working for a while. So actually, um, uh, well over a year ago, we had some external uh, medical education experts consult to review our curriculum, to interview faculty and staff, to help get a sense of you know, what were our strengths and what were things we, could, we needed to build on. Um, after their recommendations came in, uh, we formed a curriculum redesign task force. This is about 60 faculty and students from all walks, just to sort of brainstorm about what were people's interests, what were their concerns, how did they want to participate to sort of get a co coalescence of a, of a leadership group. And then in the uh, fall of 2011, starting on uh, November 1st, uh, we formed uh, eight different uh, committees to address different pieces of the curriculum. These were you know, the core biomedical curriculum, the master's program, the clinical longitudinal curriculum, ethics and humanities, uh, uh, communications, student well-being, and then a leadership uh, group to bring them all together. And then encircling the whole thing as a communications group to make sure that we actually were having this as a conversation and not just a small group of people making decisions. Very importantly, the recruitment of um, a new senior associate uh, dean for medical education was happening. Dave Nirenberg has been running medical education at uh, Geisel for 18 years, Dave? Yeah, <laughs> Just about 18 years. You can probably tell me the number of days. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, he and Dean Soda, Shoba had decided to um, transition to new leadership, and we didn't want to move forward with sort of a highly articulated plan that was completely different from the new candidate's uh, uh, needs and, and uh, strengths. And so we awaited the arrival of uh, Rich Simons, who came in June, and then hit the ground running with a, a budget proposal to Dean Shoba that was uh, uh, approved in July of this year. So uh, we'll talk about what that is to pay for, and uh, just to uh, point out that Community engagement has not begun tonight. Uh, as many of you know, we've had uh, these many task forces with more than 100 student and faculties and previous town halls and a bunch of other departmental meetings that I know have uh, involved some of you. So what will the $1.13 million that the medical education um, is devoting to the curriculum redesign this year be used to grow? So first, uh, Rich Simons, as you all know, is the new senior associate dean for medical education. He's uh, actually hard at work in uh, Boston at the moment, uh, working on um, an infrastructure uh, thing having to do with Geisel. And, uh, and, and he has uh, changed and broadened the scope of the Office of Medical Education in response to uh, uh, enhanced funding for the Office of Medical Education under Dean Shoba. 
And there are multiple offices under, uh, you know, parts of the Office of Medical Education, the new Office of Faculty Development, Medical Education. Um, uh, you, you see these here and recognize most of them. And uh, these all feed into the curriculum redesign, which is directly under uh, uh, Dean Simon's leadership. And yet the curriculum redesign has multiple parts. And so I sort of talked about some of them. You know, the, we are addressing the core biomedical curriculum, the clinical curriculum, both inpatient and outpatient, the master's program, ethics and humanities. These are sort of the, the identifiable parts of the curriculum. But I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, these things aren't you know, sort of distinct. Uh, they can't be silos. And so we've built into the structure, uh, integrating structure. So the medical learning design team uh, is uh, sort of helping us construct a coherent, overarching pedagog pedagogical strategy. We wanted to make sure that student uh, well-being and practice resilience was, was a strong piece of this curriculum, that mentorship already good at Geisel was enhanced. And we wanted to take advantage of this curriculum redesign task force that had been there, sort of a, a board of advisors that we wanted to make sure we could draw upon, get their ideas, and put questions, concerns. And tonight we're doing one of many examples of communications with the Geisel community. So <clears throat> a little later on, I'm going to um, cede the stage to uh, the leaders of the different pieces of this in hopes that all of us can have a conversation about Whatever you want to know about, the experts are in the room. Um, but Rand Swenson is leading the integrated uh, core curriculum. Nan Cochran is uh, leading the clinical curriculum. Greg Ogrentz is leading the master's program. Uh, and I'll represent him tonight. Um, Bill Nelson and I are running the ethics and humanities piece. Leslie Fall, as I mentioned, is, is uh, head of the Office of Faculty Development and is leading the team that's doing uh, medical uh, learning design. Ann Davis is the head of the, the practice resilience group uh, focused on student wellness and mentorship. And Kathy Pipus is the, uh, the, the chief of our very complicated, multifaceted communications uh, office. And as, uh, she and her staff have done a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that an event like this uh, can, uh, can happen. Uh, much more work goes into this than I ever knew. And these are the rosters of the different uh, working, uh, working groups. Um, I'll pass by the slide. Uh, it won't be on the quiz. But uh, uh, just to, to cite that there, is, uh, there are a lot of people working on this behind the, the scenes. And of course, you. I see many members of the working groups. And we've all had lots of conversations in the hallways and by emails and in meetings. And I'm hoping that's uh, only something that's going to grow. Uh, uh, this is a conversation. We want your ideas and input, and we mean that seriously. I think that's, a, that's sort of a political gesture people make in fora like these, but we genuinely believe that that's important. I, I don't think any of us feels like we really could come up with the diversity and breadth of ideas that we really need to do this. So we've got great ideas. We want to make sure we hear them from you. And, and also, you know, I think uh, we expect that we will have, uh, make mistakes or have ideas that are lame brain, and we want to hear that from you too. This is one venue that will have uh, some of those uh, conversations in this conversational domain. But as I mentioned, there are multiple outreach from our communications liaisons going out to departments and leadership and other bodies. Uh, we have involvement, as I mentioned. And we also have a web page so that if none of those sort of uh, scratches the etch, you've got another opportunity to get there. And I encourage you to take a look. It's part of the Geisel Insider curriculum redesign. Here's the URL here. And uh, there's an FAQ and, and leadership rosters and lots of information out there. So. Um, Big picture, high altitude, what sorts of ideas are we thinking about? Uh, uh, concepts are that for students, we want to make sure that the uh, education at Geisel is more engaging, more about active learning, that we harness the strength of lectures, because there are many, but we complement those with small group and other active learning approaches. We integrate the clinical and basic sciences, not one year of one and one year of the next, but all together that we provide students with what clinical care looks like. It's a longitudinal uh, activity that should begin in the first year of medical school. To provide those who want to an elective uh, master's program. To build in the uh, uh, ethics and humanities uh, material and the coordination of that material that uh, is largely missing. Not that the material is missing, although it could be built out, but the coordination is absent. 
um, and to do so in a context of strong mentorship and, and attention to well-being. For faculty, this is going to change the way we teach. You can imagine that the context in which we all teach are going to change. And also, I think that sort of the teams that we teach with are going to change. And so I think there will be teams of clinicians and basic scientists. And I'm <coughs> phrasing that vaguely intentionally. That might be not all be physician clinicians. Uh, this, these will be teams. And we will support this through the Office of Faculty Development. This is a change for all of us. And I'm going to need the faculty development. I'm sure everybody else will benefit from that too. And we recognize that good teaching involves support. And, and uh, as, it's, uh, as the support is needed for basic scientists, it should be there. And as it's needed for clinicians, it should be there. There are also other synergies that we want to take advantage of. And you've, you've probably heard of some of these. I mentioned one already, but I want to make sure you're all aware of it. So Leslie Fall was recently appointed, the, um, uh, has a new deanship and head of the Office of Faculty Development. And her office is going to help support this transition uh, with us. So I'm excited about that, having already benefited from some of her sessions. Uh, uh, she uh, and Steve McAllister and Brian Reed spearheaded an effort to bring an iPad to every student in the first year of the class, as well as a selected membership of the first year uh, faculty. And uh, we want to make sure that's just one way that we catalyze new approaches to connected teaching in the Geisel curriculum with the help of a newly uh, recruited uh, or newly recruiting education technology lead to uh, come along with some of the other uh, expansions we've had in the Office of Medical Education. Here's the timeline. So we just got some money this summer to really move this forward in a, in a big way. Um, <coughs> by next spring, we want to bring not the whole curriculum finished and polished and done and wrapped up with a bow on top, because I think it would be too early to do that, but a framework curriculum, a curriculum that sort of says, are we correct in representing this as the consensus understanding of the the calendar of a year and the new curriculum, and make sure the faculty have a chance to really opine on that. If the faculty, uh, uh, via the Medical Education Committee and an independent vote, give that approval, then we move forward. And we move forward with the construction of the specific syllabi within that uh, structure, the detail lecture by lecture, paragraph by paragraph, line by line, lecture by small group by interactive, online video, whatever, uh, and bring that the next year to another full faculty vote for approval. You, you get the sense we're working for a collaborative consensus here. This is important to us with the goal of having the first student in the new curriculum in 2015, knowing that the full four years won't be done by then. We will still be in that year working on the second year curriculum and the third year, <laughs> so that by 2019, we'll have completely changed the four year curriculum. And so we'll do framework now, this year, syllabus next year. And then it takes actually a surprising amount of time to figure out who's going to teach that syllabus, what rooms are going to be in, what, where are the classrooms for all those small uh, groups, where, uh, where, how exactly we'll do the labs. That's the implementation piece that we'll spend uh, the, the, the last year uh, doing before we start. And so um, now I want to make sure that we uh, really get this conversation going in earnest. And so uh, I want to ask the leadership of the redesign to come on up and, and uh, uh, say hi and introduce themselves. And then let's, uh, let's, let's uh, have a conversation. One thing Chris mentioned to, to me is that we have these two microphones. And so I want to make sure that um, uh, we repeat the questions when we, uh, when we get them. Did I introduce myself? I'm Leslie Fall. <laughs> you want to start, Brent? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, my name's Rand Swenson. I'm the chairman of the anatomy department, and I'm a neurologist as well. And uh, I'm uh, the head or the chair of the uh, core biomedical uh, curriculum committee. Um, we've got quite a good group. We've uh, had a good group last year um, and added um, some new faces to it. We're just starting um, 
considering some of the things that we looked at last year and um, going to be moving those things forward over the next several months. And uh, there are, um, maybe we could put up the original slide with all the members. Um, there are members of many of your um, departments that are represented on this committee. and. Uh, I'd certainly be more than happy to come talk to any of the departments as we go along and um, update them as to where we are. At this stage, I can give you some very broad ideas. We've been charged with uh, um, designing a curriculum for biomedical sciences that's integrated, that is um, clinical and basic sciences um, integrated, that carries through all four years, or as close to it as we can, of the curriculum rather than um, ending uh, when we send students off to, uh, to clinics. And, um, and that it meet the um, modern requirements and the LCME requirements for uh, uh, mm -hmm. providing students uh, uh, opportunities for active engagement and um, active learning um, in, the, in the course of the curriculum. So I'd be happy to share ideas as we go along from what we did in our original committee that started to look at this last year. Um, our new committee that's uh, just launching, um, we've got some ideas going, and I know several of you are on it in here, so uh, we can discuss those ideas, but that's, uh, um, they're very preliminary at this stage. Thank you. So I'm Nan Cochran, I'm an internist and geriatrician. I've run the Undoctoring course forever. <laughs> and uh, I'm in charge of the work group focusing on the clinical and longitudinal curriculum. And uh, the list up there is a little shorter than it was because I simply provided the list of those who are actively working on the Undoctoring pilot, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But our goals are to really try and integrate clinical training more systematically and make it a lot stronger than it's been, particularly in the first two years. The clerkships will continue, they will probably be modified, but the first two years have not had a significant focus, and that's going to be altered with the new curriculum. And our goals are to provide longitudinal relationships with early medical students and patients and their families, as well as longitudinal mentoring relationships with faculty and with all members of the team that they're working on, starting literally, you know, the first month of medical school. And uh, we expect to provide them with a lot more feedback and a lot more clinical instruction and do that in an integrated way. And by that I mean that rather than learning clinical skills here on campus, as is currently done, than going to one of 160 preceptors' offices in the community up to 75 minutes away, we hope to be able to teach in small groups in the clinical sites so that one has the opportunity to learn a skill, practice a skill in a simulated environment with on-site feedback immediately, practice it again if necessary, then see patients that very afternoon with the same faculty member observing you and then, again, talk about a debrief. So there's an integration of the two faculty that have traditionally been involved in undoctoring, and that, that's what our pilot is currently about now. We're doing this in a very small way this year, working uh, with experienced faculty because we didn't have time to do adequate faculty development for the whole community. And our goal is really to test, to pilot test, is this going to work, is this feasible, is it, as they say, non-inferior? We expect that it will be superior, but we don't know that yet until the end of the year. And then our challenges will be, if so, can we scale it up? How expensive will it be? What kind of faculty development will be required? And what kind of infrastructure will be required? We've gotten a lot of help from Leslie Fall, which has been fabulous in terms of faculty development. The iPads are also contributing. Um, and I can answer a lot more questions, but I think I've run out of time. Good evening, I'm Kathy Pipus, I'm a family physician and assistant dean of medical education, and I'm leading the communications working group. Our group um, is purposely representative of each of the groups, so in our working group we have a rep from each of the groups um, brought against faculty, basic science, clinical science students. Um, the three main areas we've been working on are, are the who, um, the, the what, and the how. So who are the audiences that we need um, to 
hear from and to get information to. And um, we've created a communication uh, curriculum liaison um, proposal. And so each department, each um, audience, uh, group of audiences, um, whether it's the alumni group or whether it's the anatomy department or whether it's the first year students, has an assigned liaison that we'll be reaching out in the next um, few weeks. The, um, the what is the content, and for the most part we've started with FAQs, what are your questions about the curriculum, and as more is developed we'll be presenting um, through the website and others, um, uh, other methods, uh, what information and what questions uh, the redesign group has of, of, of the entire Dartmouth community. And uh, the third piece being the how, and um, really determining how you best learn about and become knowledgeable about curriculum, past, present, and future, um, and how we get your input. And um, hopefully all of you have received, can I just do a quick show of hands, how many of you have received a survey in the last 48 hours asking? And I guess the more important show of hands, how many of you have not received a survey asking for your input on how we can best communicate to you? So I have, okay. If you would, um, maybe Pam send a note back. We'd love to know um, your roles and your emails because our, one of our major um, tasks has been to identify um, a, an email system, and I thank Derek, or is Derek, um, in the communications groups to overcome that barrier we have of making sure that we have a master list of, of our faculty, students, and staff. Um, so those of you who don't, I'm going to send a piece of paper from Pam Guile right here um, to get your information. The, um, <coughs> Preliminary information I have as, as questions come out through the evening um, to be able to share some of that. But in 48 hours, we've gotten 368 responses, um, and 60% and of those or so are, are faculty. Um, we have found that, um, unfortunately, um, only 60 or excuse me, 64% of um, the responders feel that they have a fair. Um, to poor knowledge of the current curriculum. So when we asked about the future curriculum, 85% have a fair to poor knowledge of that. So I guess in terms of current curriculum, we're not doing so so badly, but um, those, are, those are really poor numbers. So our goal was to increase communication. Um, and we also heard that the top, uh, the, the number two way people have learned so far about the curriculum has been town hall, so that's been um, reassuring. Um, email seems to be the number one preference. I guess that's our, our culture here is email, email, email. And both how people prefer to hear about information and how people prefer to um, give information. So we appreciate um, your uh, filling out that survey. It'll give us lots more information about how to reach out to you. And I'm happy to answer any questions as we go forward tonight. I'm Ann Davis. I'm Associate Dean of Students. I'm in the Department of Pediatrics and the Department of OBGYN. And I have uh, a work group that really intersects strongly uh, with each of the other work groups. And we have, after much debate, called ourselves the complete physician. But our goal is, as uh, Tim said, is in the realm of mentoring uh, relationships and also a resilience curriculum with a heavy focus on well-being, since that is so correlated with professionalism and uh, with uh, many other aspects, patient safety and a lifelong engagement in careers. So many other schools are developing a part of their curriculum to be a resilience curriculum to help students uh, be able to address those stressors that are not going to go away because many of the stressors of medicine are unavoidable. We also have uh, attention on culture. We have uh, three work groups actually that we're going to split into this year. We've worked as a general group together. We have the mentorship and advising work group, a resilience curriculum work group that we'll break into, and then finally a culture uh, work group. And of course the attention on culture also relates to the outcomes that we want. Um, we know that nothing relates to well-being as strongly as culture and nothing relates to professionalism in terms of evidence-based uh, data as uh, well-being. So that's our focus and I have, uh, since I do spend time at the hospital, had many people saying, why would you have a focus on well-being? I'd be glad to address that. Hi, I'm Bill Nelson, and um, I'm a healthcare ethicist, um, and I'm in multiple departments, um, psychiatry, community and family medicine, uh, but spend a lot of my time also in teaching and working in um, the integration of ethics and TDI. And with um, my friend, colleague, um, Tim, we're co-leading 
the Ethics and Humanities work group. And it's a, a great work group. And as you can see from the list of people, we have people from um, multiple disciplines because what our real goal is in terms of the work group is to integrate ethics and healthcare humanities or medical humanities into the overall redesign curriculum. So that's why we're focusing and taking people into our work group um, who come from various disciplines such as um, law, spirituality, anthropology, narrative writing, literature, and of course ethics. And that all of those themes and the content and methodologies from those various disciplines can then contribute to the development of what we want from our, a student graduating from this school. Um, we've learned over uh, the years, if you will, and even this summer we did a survey of um, medical students and what we found, um, we asked them a couple basic questions per year, um, each of the four years. Um, what was your perception on the amount of time that was spent in like ethics teaching or law or spirituality? Etc. Etc. And then we asked a follow-up question: Do you think that was enough? And as part of the scale was not nearly enough, and that was the overwhelming response for almost every year for many of these disciplines um, that our work group is focusing in on. So working in a collaborative way to to these people to my right, um, we want to see how we can then coordinate the integration of this material not necessarily in a silo approach, but how do we integrate that into the overall curriculum of the school. So before we open this up, um, I wanted to just represent for Greg Ogrens, who's doing the master's uh, portion of the curriculum. Um, so, um, you know, the driver for this is that, <clears throat> you know, Becca's future career is going to be hugely different from Jessica's career. Uh, as different as, as Kathy Kirkland's uh, is from uh, Jean Natty's. And we wanted to make sure that our curriculum allowed students to be able to get the diverse training that they needed to be ready for that kind of diverse career uh, uh, future. And so we think it's important to build in an elective program for 20, 30 students, a program that could be fit within the four years of medical school that would meet the criteria that, you're, that all the other masters here are required to meet, that you would have at least 80 rigorous hours uh, as, uh, as uh, built into the regular curriculum for all students, plus additional training for the uh, master students, including a scholarly project. And that this work wouldn't be abstract and out here, but something integrated with the rest of the experience. They would, for instance, in the context of their longitudinal clinical experience, develop a project to change for the better that healthcare system using the training that they've got at TDI. So that's the basis for that and uh, working very closely with uh, Chip Shoba and Kathy Pipus on leadership training that would be necessary to be leaders in healthcare. Not you know, sort of uh, suit and tie, numbers crunching, uh, you know, MBA types of leaders. Not that those are bad, but that's not what our students typically are going uh, to medical school for, but people who are ready to be agents of change and, and uh, experts. So um, why don't we stop talking? And I've got a microphone, happy to pass this on to uh, anybody who's got a question or a comment, observation, happy to, happy to hear from you. So, I don't see any um, influence here of people like Gil Welch. Can you tell me, I, I just gave a lecture to the first year students in the current first year classwork, and in the small groups that we're running, we talked about some of the things that Gil Welch has published in respect to um, evidence-based medicine and making decisions in his book, actually. So. Uh, it seems to me that's a missing piece here. So that's, uh, let me use this. Um, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, one of the major strengths of the Dartmouth community is, you know, that, that we're uh, out there, you know, people here who are out front advising Obama and other world leaders about the proper way to evaluate healthcare, how to think critically about the data, 
and how to understand the system better, how to change the system. So healthcare delivery science is the, the core of the master's program. Um, but importantly, although that is being developed by the group that will make master's uh, uh, content only for that subset of students who choose to do the master's, the, the, uh, at least half of the, the healthcare delivery science curriculum of that master's is going to be built into the core curriculum and every student will take that. But then that subset of, of, of students who want to go deeper and really prepare themselves to be leaders in that then would take the extra stuff in the, in the master's. So one of the tracks in the, in the master's program is on um, evaluation of data and, and inference. That's one of the particular foci of that because you're right, that's absolutely important and something that we could grow here. Well, I, I would think, um, mostly because I've just been thinking about the way he thinks about things, mm -hmm. that that would be more important than that, that that should be really in one of these uh, columns, uh, trying to get students to think about critically about how they evaluate any piece of information, whether it's a blood pressure value that they get from themselves or mm -hmm. their classmates, or in a more complex case, um, the way you deliver CPR in different hospitals. Um, Let me, um, I have to hold this up. I'm not Greg, obviously, but uh, I think he could say, and Greg and I work a lot together in TDI, um, that in both the current HSP, the Masters of Healthcare Delivery Science material is being integrated as part of that. I, I don't have the full syllabus in front of me. Also, even before that, there are multiple hours where much of the TDI thinking of the science of health delivery is being integrated. So there, it is currently being done to some extent. Yeah. We, uh, I'm sorry? I agree, it is now. Yes. But where is it here? Is that going to go away or is that going to be re revitalized or re-emphasized? It grows. I, I'm obviously not Leslie Fall either, but I guess I would comment that I think this concept of critical thinking is going to be both content with specific areas as well as a, uh, a method of teaching and active learning that's going to go across all of these. So I think that the um, redesign, the group looking at how to um, in, in redesign your curriculum with appropriate pedagogy um, and appropriate um, learning tools. We'll be using the concepts of that as methods across, and I'm going to pass to Rand to be thinking again, how do you integrate that into everything? Because I think <laughs> to give it one column, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on how else you would do that, but it really has to be a thread that crosses everything. Well, I mean, it is. It is a column. It's Greg's column. It's uh, you know where it says masters. It's not just the masters. The uh, the focus is going to be on developing a program that's rigorous in healthcare delivery sciences that for select for select students can be expanded where they can go more deeply and also do a scholarly project and come out with a masters as well. Their work is going to fertilize all of this. So. When, for example, we uh, in the core biomedical curriculum, when there where there's a where there's a, say a case-based uh, uh, learning exercise on 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 stroke, where uh, um, um, a, a deeper discussion of you know so how is the healthcare system organized so that a stroke patient can be adequately managed when they happen to be in Colebrook or um, when, when they're in a medically underserved area or, or whatever, that will be integrated into those kind of, those kind of studies by those individuals who will, who will essentially construct a thread that goes across, not just across the biomedical curriculum, but also the clinical curriculum and, and, and their own separate um, elements that they'll, that, they'll, um, that they'll seed along the way where it's needed to reinforce certain things. So that group that you see is essentially going to be the ones that are shepherding that through the curriculum and it's going to be a thread that appears everywhere within the curriculum. Not, you know, you got, to, you got your two hours now, go for it. That's not the way, that's not the way it's going to be. 
Yeah, just to build a little on that. So for instance, when they're in their longitudinal clinical sites and we're teaching them about screening, okay, they will learn something about the epidemiology, they'll learn something about demographics, they'll learn to question the value of screening. We'll use probably the example of PSA screening, which as we know has evolved significantly over the last decade. We'll focus on other kinds of screening, which are currently being questioned, and Gil is out in front, you know, leading that questioning. So I think that in small groups, that teaching is definitely going to be focused on. And all of the students, as Tim said, will be exposed to a lot of healthcare delivery science, more than they are currently. Okay. Joe? Can I give a shot at that one, too? Because I think uh, eventually, where it's going to be is from what Ann said, is in the culture. You know, this is how we do things here. And at the moment you're with a patient, hopefully our students and our faculty will be thinking about those types of things and the decisions they make at that moment with the patient. And right now, it doesn't happen. You know, Gil is over here being a nudge, and uh, rather than in the main conversations that are happening around here. And hopefully a student that comes through here will have those types of things in their um, conversations that they're having around the patient in front of them or the population in front of them. Jerry Dunlap, Care of Genetics. Uh, so my discipline is one that did not exist 100 years ago um, and, and barely existed the last time the curriculum was tweaked. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so I, I guess I'm speaking to factoids. Uh, uh, Presumably students are still going to be taking the boards after year two, um, and uh, uh, nobody wants to put more hours in the first two years, and nobody's a fan of didactic lectures, um, although none of us learned thermodynamics um, uh, in uh, any other way. Uh, so I, I guess I, I want to hear about the core curriculum, uh, how, how you're going to deal with uh, uh, new, new things and, uh, uh, and we're going to integrate uh, small groups to do uh, more hands-on doctoring, which I think is a fine idea. Uh, what's going to go? Uh, because no one wants to put more hours in those years. So uh, uh, what, what are your general thoughts? How is this going to work? Well, I, you know, I'm not going to uh, prejudge what, the, what this committee is going to come out with as, as, a, as a final product. but I. I, I can tell you that, that there's a lot of sympathy on the committee for, for making sure that whatever comes out is going to be rigorous and that it's not going to be um, uh, just fluff. And, and the fact is that um, integ we feel uh, as a group, I, I, will, I do think I speak for the group, that, that um, by integrating basic and clinical sciences, we can <coughs> encourage medical students to take it more seriously and to recognize the the importance of the basic science when they when they do um, uh, confront patients later in their in their uh, career and also one of the important things to remember is that what we want to do is we want to find a way and I think we can find a way to make sure that the basic science curriculum doesn't end when you know, they get done with their first year of medical school, that, that it's something that, that gets revisited at appropriate places through, through the later stages of the curriculum. Um, we're kind of designing a, a shell at this point. Um, one, of the, one of our jobs is going to be kind of designing some ideas around which we're, that are going to be used uh, to decide who the who the proper leadership is, you know, that's going to be really critical in, in, in any of these areas, uh, for example, genetics, or who's going to be the, who's, who's, who are the best people? And, and I say that people because I, I do think that it's going to wind up being a much more collaborative effort. And also, one of the important things in the new curriculum is going to be that, I mean, let's say they do take um, a, a, a core part of genetics early in their, uh, early in their experience. Having that group examine what they're getting elsewhere in the curriculum as they go along to see how um, those principles that they learned then can be revisited at these points through the second year, third year, fourth year of their curriculum in order to um, cement these things and to bring them back when they have um, some clinical 
experience to to provide uh, relevance. I mean, most most clinicians. I, I I mean, most clinicians will tell you that you know there's. Um, you know, they really wish they could go back and study basic science after they, after they did their clinical training because it means a lot more. You know, you, you put, it in, put it in context of, of what you see. And I think that's going to be one of, the, one of our jobs is going to be to, to, to design the proper mechanics to do that. And I, and I think most of the people on the committee are very sensitive to the fact that we want to make sure that our students pass the boards, for example. I, I will say that the boards are changing quite a bit, too. I, 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 sit on the boards and, and the questions that are asked have a much more clinical tilt to them. Um, n not that they don't have a lot of core basic science, but they do have a lot of clinical tilt as well. And I think, I think adding that and integrating that together really will make a more solid student where it's more meaningful. At least that's, that's my hope. I'll also tell you that uh, some of the schools that have moved down to 15 months or a year and a half of preclinical curriculum and then moved earlier and had p uh, students take their boards, um, obviously given the timing of the boards, they're into their clinical years. Those students had outperformed at their previous levels for those schools. Um, and there's not a lot of them, but so far every one of them has. And, and I agree with Rand. I know, Jay, I wish I uh, had paid a lot more attention to some of your arenas when I went through school. Um, and um, I will tell you that I think it'll be extremely valuable to increase the basic science in the clinical years for the exact reason you talked about, the boards. I, too, have written for the boards, and now the um, uh, upper level boards are increasing slowly and steadily the amount of basic science that's being asked. So. I wanted to just reinforce what you just said. I, um, you said Ann and Rand did, and I'm happy to hear it. But as a physician, I find my experience that nothing has been more valuable to me than a knowledge at the bedside, a knowledge of pathophysiology. And hopefully, you know, no more valuable to me or to my patient, hopefully, uh, and to those I'm teaching as well. Uh, and what I really would like to see would be to see the thread through the four years of how we develop an understanding of inflammation or of cancer biology uh, or of normal human development as it progresses to abnormal human behavior. And Rather than relying on uh, each of the four years to, to sequentially uh, introduce concepts, there needs to be a thread of understanding so that we understand how we're going to teach inflammation throughout the entire four years in cancer biology. And I'd like to actually be able to see how, how that's going to take shape. Maybe you already have a plan for that, but that seems to be, to be a, a very critical uh, piece of this redesign. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I couldn't, ag couldn't agree more. I mean, the, we, our original thoughts are that there will be several threads that follow through the curriculum, introduced early on, but things that will be revisited periodically. And we haven't, I mean, we've got some ideas and we've thrown around a lot of ideas as to what those threads might be. But, uh, um, and we may even be soliciting, soliciting ideas from the general faculty you know, not, not even, of course we want ideas, but you know, in a very formal way we might be soliciting ideas as to what those threads should be. But, um, but you know, threads that are looked at periodically and looked at throughout the, the four years will be present within this curriculum, I can guarantee you that. To, to give you an example, <clears throat> we had a morning meeting this, this morning where the major topic was how would, one of the major topics was how would we build that basic science explicitly into the curriculum, into the clerkship piece of the, of the year? What would be the opportunities to bring students back and say, okay, now you've been in the ICU, do you understand how, you know, uh, uh, alpha and beta you know, receptors on vascular endothelium really make a difference? But just as a follow-up again, speaking from experience in our field, infectious disease, you know, how we diagnose diseases changes every five years. How we treat the diseases that we treat changes every five years. That seems to be a lot less important to me to learn throughout 
in medical school and again I, I have really thorough understanding of basic pathophysiologic principles because hopefully you know obviously our thinking does change but we we build on new knowledge rather than shifting our uh, worldview uh, every five to ten years and, and, and I think I'll echo that but maybe take it just a, 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 a subtle step further and that is that I think the integrating functions are important you know the 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 value for research experiences for students has historically been something that's been underappreciated simply because it, it, it's a, an opportunity to instill rigor in a curriculum that has not, you know, uh, historically been deemed strong in rigor. The PhD curriculum is always very steeped in rigor, but medical curricula have historically been, you know, more deficient. They, it's much harder to do that. And so there's a real opportunity here to develop rigor and go on. But I, I think it has to span the whole spectrum of the curriculum and how the different aspects talk to each other is probably as important as everything else. Because we're going into an era now, and, and I think everybody in this room that teaches students realize that we have unlimited information. What we don't have is we don't have filters. And we've got to figure out how to give them filters. Because they get, they got pocket this, pocket that. They've got, you know, the information is there. What they can't do is they can't pick out what's important out of that information. And so I think we have to empower the students to be able to make decisions. And, and, and with that said, uh, you know, and, and, and I think it's also important that we also instill in the students the ability to interpret primary information because one of the byproducts of the era that we're in is that information is increasingly being interpreted for students and physicians, okay? So it's now, now up to date, and it's this meta-analysis and systematic review. And, and for areas where you have, you know, evidence, that's very, very, very powerful. But the problem is, is that there's a fine line where at some point in time you don't have that. And, and we're realizing that well, we're just trading one form of biases for another form of biases. And they have to be able to distinguish between those things. So critical analytic fields, you know, thinking is, 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 is the most important thing. And um, they're going to learn different aspects of critical analytic thinking in the different components that you have up there. And so, you know, that's a loquacious way of reiterating what he said, but I think all of these have to talk to each other for that to really work. Can I just respond to that for one sec before we take the next question? So, for instance, when we get to this new redesign curriculum, any small group would be headed by both a basic scientist as well as a clinician so that we would have constant dialogue between those two points of view. Both would be represented at all times. So for instance, right now in the second year where um, clinical reasoning is taught and frankly not very well, some of it's done in PBL, some of it's done in undoctoring. Historically there's been very little communication between the two courses about who's doing what when, how, and where. And that has really started to change, which it's about time and it's very exciting. And I feel like there's going to be much more uh, seeding of each other's thought processes. And I think it's going to be tremendously <coughs> beneficial to the students. I realize that the plans are in a very preliminary stage as yet, but I'm just a little unclear as to whether your these changes are at least predominantly in the first two years or whether you're planning to start the clinical clerkships earlier so that students will be going on, you know, seven, eight, <coughs> six, whatever you guys decide in the end, clinical clerkships starting in the second year. Um, are we going to be keeping the elective type system? So maybe these are details you've not got up to, but I'm, I'm just trying to see how major the, the changes are going to be once we get into the clinical years. Oh, the, the currently clinical years. I know it'll all be clinical years. <laughs> well, you're right. I mean, we haven't come to a conclusion on that. But I, I, if you look at medical education in general, one of the things that, that Tim didn't say at the beginning of this was we did do a, a, a project looking at medical education, how other schools have have reformed medical education gone, gone around and and taken you know new curricula innovative curricula and said okay so what are they doing differently and um, we've we've got a website and we, we had one of these town halls in fact on that topic and one of the thing one of the movements in, in uh, medical education in general is to try to move the clerkships a little bit earlier which provides a little bit more space than within the clinical curricula if you will to do other things, to add things, 
perhaps we've we've discussed perhaps spacing clerkships out where there's a little bit a little bit more space in between so people can can have that time to revisit things reflect on what they did instead of busting right off to the next clerkship for example and that that's one model that that will be considered I I'm, again, I'm not going to prejudge what what the committee says, but um, those kind of those kind of opportunities become possible if we can let, let's say move uh, medical students into the clinics in say March instead of June which, or July. And uh, for example, the University of Vermont's curriculum that's that that was one of the modifications that they made. Um, um, I'm, incidentally, I'm not, I'm not saying their model is great, but, um, but you know, it's one of the ways in which you can then make space to do things um, later on that you couldn't have done in a, in a curriculum that's crammed with required clerkships and then, oh, the students are off interviewing for the residencies. So um, that's something that's being considered. So for instance, during those intercessions, back to John's point and others, one would have some of the advanced medical sciences come back in. So for instance, we may focus on inflammation, we may focus on cancer, we may focus on genetics. We also may focus during those two or three week intercessions, and we really don't know yet exactly what they're going to look like or how long they will be, on advanced communication skills, which we have really not focused on in teaching our medical students. So they're not learning anywhere near enough about, back to the cancer idea, Breaking bad news to a patient. This is something they're going to have to do probably in their sub eyes and certainly on day one of internship. And we're not teaching that effectively currently, nor are we teaching shared decision making effectively. So there are a bunch of other skills that need to be taught during those intercessions. But again, having small groups composed of both a clinician and a basic scientist, I think will really enable us to tackle both. The only thing I'd add is, again, in looking at multiple other schools, um, there are a lot of different um, pieces of this being tried. Again, not all the evaluation is back. Um, Hofstra is one of the schools, um, and they're actually coming on September 27th, so we're committed to continuing to learn from these schools. Um, Dr. Lawrence Smith um, is doing a 9 to 10.30 session as well as a Grand Rounds that day to highlight some of the innovations that occurred there and for us to hear more detail and depth um, and begin to pick out what the pieces that we want to implement. Uh, hi, I'm Bob Harris, radiology and OBGYN, and uh, I have a two-part question. The first question goes back, and it's probably not a fair question because Greg Ogrink isn't here, and I think I'm number five on his working group, but back in the winter, uh, as a pond hockey game playing with uh, Nan Fisher, and she asked me if I'd be interested in working on the Global Health Committee at that time, and I guess there was a Global Health Pathway being envisioned at that time, and said, sure, because I have modest experience in global health. And so I joined it, and uh, I just met with Greg last week. And uh, he said, well, it's kind of undergone morphing and changing and, and, and is evolving. But um, I know if the group is very strong in TDI. I went to TDI in 2009. I was a kind of a slouch of a student, but I got my degree. And, uh, you know, I have global health experience. I think, um, I don't know if anybody else does in the group, but I'd like to, you know, persist in that and, and get it off the ground. I don't know if that's still part of the process because it's the first time I ever heard it called the master's program. I thought it was going to be one of the other, one of the other programs. Um, so I don't know if you can address that or not. Greg's not here. But the other question I had is, what, what earmarks is the 1.1 million dollars going for? I'll let Tim do the money part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, on. As a member of Greg's working group, I can tell you that he felt very committed to his message to the first working group that he pulled together that they would do a charge and be completed. So I know he felt like he wanted to re-invite, um, but I have made a note here, Bob, and I will make sure that it is known that you want to continue on that group. And I think there are many people who were on the working groups initially. We, we did have phases, and so as these are being recreated, um, if you were on one before and you want to be on another working group, please don't hesitate to contact any one of us. Um, if you you still want to be involved and, and haven't received information because they're they're reforming based on some of that money. But can I, there's a Dartmouth wide global health group that we can get you on to. You know, the, the big Dartmouth is trying to figure out what's and they're going to do something in global health that will be substantial. Okay. And then um, before I hit the, the money piece um, about the global health piece of the, the masters. In our conversations, one of the big things that we um, realized is that, you know, boy, we're 
thinking about redesigning the entire curriculum, including a master's, and the idea of, of, of building three separate tracks within a new master's at the t- same time that we did the whole thing, really realized it would make sense to have a vision like that, but to stage it. And so the idea is to start the master's on a, a, a core strength of healthcare delivery science and leadership with an eye to say, okay, now that we've got this tuned, the, the, the first thing that sort of comes to mind is there really is a, a, a critical and growing mass of people with global health expertise here, and, 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 and they will be part of that, but could you build it out over time to, to, to make it even more than it is? So, so glad, you're, glad you're still into it. Thank you. So about money. Um, the, the bulk of the uh, $1.13 million is going to salary for the uh, leaders of the uh, redesign working groups that are up here and their lieutenants to sort of spend time building curriculum, doing assessments of the current curriculum, uh, you know, doing the surveys, holding the meetings, you know, et cetera, just to sort of uh, uh, make this work happen. So. You know, for instance, our uh, working group is sort of, uh, you know, meeting for several hours a week, uh, or not meeting for several hours a week, that would be really painful, but working for several hours a week, and, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're like, yeah, I didn't, what are you making up, Tim? But sort of, e- each of them are sort of really just sort of getting time apart from clinical or research uh, uh, projects to, to really go deep in this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need a microphone. I think that I... Oh. Uh, I had a couple of questions about um, the clinical faculty and how um, they will be engaged in this curriculum once it through the process of transition but also ultimately in delivering it and um, I'll just frame it a couple of ways one is that there are like 600 plus physicians just in Lebanon and then there are people at the VA, and there are people in the community group practices, and then there's all the community physicians, many of whom are adjunct faculty. And if you just did the numbers, you could assign like four faculty to every student and then still have people left over. Um, And yet I don't see, I've been surprised since I've been here for 12 years that unlike at Duke, there doesn't seem to be any explicit expectation that clinical faculty really engage and um, contribute uniformly to the curriculum. I think it's an opportunity that many people would like to take advantage of and that we could create a structure to um, get them engaged to everyone's benefit. The second piece of it that I'd just be interested in how we're thinking about it and who and where the liaison sort of sits is around, I've noticed that the way we structure clinical care right now, there's a lot of rapid transitions of faculty members through clinical services, and I'm not sure that it's in optimizing the educational experience, and I wonder, it seems like this is also an opportunity to look at how we're delivering the clinical care and sort of maybe thinking about rethinking that along with how we deliver education. Again, that might have benefit to many within the curriculum and also beyond to the patients, et cetera. So I guess a lot of this seems like it's thinking hard about the first two years and the students in the first two years, but I wonder how could we um, really make sure that when we send them off over to the Hitchcock and beyond that these same principles are optimally delivered. Maybe uh, I can start and then pass it to Kathy and Nan. Um, I think this is a really key question. A a piece of this has to do with resourcing teaching in the clinical context, and maybe I'll take that first. So, you know, we, as you say, we have a large clinical faculty, and, and, and many of us do hands-on uh, teaching to varying uh, degrees, and yet it is extremely unusual for a, a clinician faculty member to have any support to do that teaching. And, and that's certainly um, a structural 
uh, component to uh, the way teaching gets done. And, uh, and so articulating exactly uh, how uh, clinical teaching is being done at Geisel is an ongoing goal. And so uh, Rich Simons and, and Chip Shoba are working with Geisel Finance to sort of figure out how, how can we make sure that the, the funding for teaching really does support the kind of context for, for clinical teaching as it should be. Um, and then uh, before I pass off, uh, uh, I met with Jim Weinstein yesterday to talk about this. And as you know, he's uh, you know got his sleeves rolled up and is working intimately with how do we make sure that our uh, clinical delivery structure actually sort of meets the needs of the, the patients and the population, and how might we do that and structure that in an innovative way. And we had a, a great conversation about um, annealing the sort of the, the, the teaching context to those innovative team-based delivery uh, 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 systems. So, so that's a piece of it, and then maybe I can pass over to some ideas. Over here. Kathy, thank you. I, um, I think you're, you're hitting one of the elephants in the room, in essence. Um, I don't have the answers to it, but I can validate from the survey that you're absolutely right on in terms of 40% um, of the responders, which are roughly all faculty, um, are saying that they have little or none um, to the question about engagement in the medical student education. So, so I think what I'm hearing and, and what makes obvious sense is that phase two survey is what are the barriers? Because all we asked is are they engaged? We didn't ask why not if they're not. So now we know, we knew it, we know it, um, that they're not engaged to a, to a high degree and, and to find out why not um, makes, makes good sense. I think we have lots of theories and we can create a survey easily. Um, and, then, and, and then obviously the next step is to begin to overcome those barriers. Um, related to the community practice um, and, and the large number of, of volume of precepting and, and teaching that we, we rely on outside of this walls, and they, have, um, they are, are um, critical um, to our teaching in this model and in future models, and we'll continue to consider them one of our top audiences um, for communications. And uh, highlight Sarah Johansson, who's here, who's the um, chair of the com Community Preceptor Education Board, um, who oversees a group of representatives from the community faculty, and she is on our communication working group um, as the communication liaison. Um, to those those faculty and I partner with her as, as medical director of the Office of Community Education Research so they are very much um, one of our targets for, for communication and input and we'll be having equivalent town halls with that group as well. Yeah um, it's a great question and it's a really big one and it's been a problem here for a really long time anybody who's been involved in medical education is well aware of that and I know Dave has fought for years and trying to get a certain fraction of every faculty member's time devoted to clinical teaching and unfortunately didn't succeed and we're still fighting that battle. I have to say since CHIP came we actually now are remunerating our facilitators and preceptors in undoctoring in almost a reasonable way. It's not pathetic and embarrassing the way it used to be. So that's a huge step forward and in terms of the pilot that we're conducting now we have uh, a small group in the first year class, 16 students, who are working in groups of four in four different primary care sites locally. And uh, all of the faculty engaged are being remunerated for their time, commensurate with the time they are putting in. So that's a huge step forward. And you know, it took some work. Tim had to had to work for us as well and uh, Rich Freeman, I'm sorry he's not here to talk about it, has been very supportive. But um, you're right, it's going to be a big step too. Well, I don't think it's just about money. I mean, no, I don't it's either. It's about being part of the community of teaching and I just and have to say that the students are learning from these faculty who are not teaching. No, you're, you're, you are talking... more from those faculty than they are from those of us who would say, yes, we spend some of our time teaching. So I just, I would love to be involved in trying to figure out how we solve this in a positive way. I don't mean to be negative or whining. I just, this is a great opportunity to try to be creative and figure it out. 
No, I, I'm totally with you. Unfortunately, we don't have the leadership in the room to respond because I think this would be an appropriate conversation to have with them present as well. Sure. On a positive note, and I think this is an elephant in the room because there's certainly a lot of unengaged people that are out there in our faculty, but on a positive note, last spring I taught HSP and I made an effort to go through the entire room uh, on the large uh, one days the whole class was there, and I asked students what the strength of this school was. And almost every one of them said, I have had amazing faculty members teach me. So, I mean, I don't want the faculty to think that the students don't think I'm seeing some nods, that there, we have some unbelievable dedicated faculty members also. So, Kathy, your questions were great. I have one generic question and then a couple of responses to sort of thought things. I wonder if you guys, as a thought exercise, forget about what the curriculum is, but just say, if we're gonna have this integration across four years, science and clinical practice, how many clinicians, how many basic scientists, how many rooms do you need? And then add on to that matrix that some of those rooms may be out in San Francisco, because what I agree, we have a lot of clinical faculty that are disengaged in teaching, but I'm trying to do some math in my head, and we now take a lecture that has 80, 90 students in it, and make it into five, 10 small group sessions for everything we teach across four years, and they're all gonna have <coughs> basic scientists in them, and some of them are gonna be halfway across the country. Those, those, to me, seem like really practical issues that it might be good to just do the modeling on before um, trying to figure out what the curriculum is that actually goes into it, to figure out how many people you need, how many rooms you need, you know, et cetera. Um, the other one that I will raise as a total elephant, giant elephant in the room, that I would like to see discussed is historically one of the problems I think we have with our structure is that everyone who has clinical privileges at, at Hitchcock has to have a faculty title. So the faculty title isn't representative of people who really want to be engaged with students. And I don't know if it could ever come about, but if we could have people who practiced at Hitchcock who want to be physicians and people who have faculty titles at Hitchcock that want to be involved in medical education, it would go a long way to actually, I think, addressing a number of these problems we have. Your second comment is above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, as far as the first one, for your, your first comment, you're absolutely right. I mean, we could come up with a curriculum that is unsupportable both financially, physically, and, and, and in the environment. Um, one, one, um, one thing I, I do want to um, say that's, um, I, I don't want to leave the impression that anybody in the committees that I've been on believe that this curriculum is going to be completely taught in small groups or anything like that. I mean, you know, one of, one of the clear messages, we've done a bunch of s polls of our groups uh, just to, just as kind of icebreakers, you know, where is everybody to begin with? And one of, the, you know, there's very clear agreement that, that, I mean, the pedagogy should follow the topic, not the other way around. And, and, and so, I mean, we're not doing away with lectures. For example, when they're most efficient. Um, and and our, our curriculum does have a fair number of small groups, which are, which are very resource intensive. That's absolutely true. You know, it's hard, it's, you know, running SBM neurology, getting people, you know, consistently down here, clinicians down here with, with you know, taking time to be with medical students is, is not an easy, is not an easy thing now. In this new curriculum, hopefully with a little bit of increased resources, with a little increased attention, I think we'll be. I, I think we will be able to do that. You're right. I mean, we have to. You know, we're building a new education building. Do, is it going to have enough small group rooms? Are we Are we going to have enough enough facilities? It's going to be. It's going to be a question. And, that, and that's why I said actually it would be interesting to do the modeling and to come back. And obviously, it's not going to be exact. But I mean, I've watched Dave be Mel Gibson fighting the English to get you know one big <laughs> classroom for small groups. And you know, I think. 
that would be useful information to have in hand of what's the space and what are the people that you need, irrespective of what the content is to get this to go. I, I fully agree. <laughs> Leslie, I'll um, reflect for a second on your second part because I'm, I'm envisioning this um, survey number two, maybe labeling it the elephant in the room survey. Um, <laughs> but when we and those of us in the room who um, designed the first survey recognized we wanted to go further with this first question of how well do you feel you're engaged with medical student education to the next level of how satisfied are you with that engagement? And um, we have a lot of qualitative comments that came in, and there's a lot of dissatisfaction. So I think before we jump to that they're not interested, um, and maybe it's phased in, and those questions are how engaged are you, how satisfied are you, and what are the barriers? Um, so I think we need to look at both ends of that. But it, it, it makes absolute sense that that's where we go next. Hang on one sec, Jess. So just to respond as well, Leslie. Um, that's exactly what we're going to be doing in my work group this year in terms of the clinical curriculum because you're right, it's a crisis and it's not going away and the number of students that we admit to Dartmouth is not going to drop significantly, although we've been lobbying for that. Um, and I think that's one of our biggest challenges is scalability given the limited infrastructure and that and the limited number of faculty. So it's going to be a question of a huge amount of faculty development, uh, paying faculty appropriately, finding the right venues. But I think again, the flip side again, if you're now going to have basic science faculty who, frankly, their careers depend on having productive research and telling them, okay, and now go drive down to Nashua because you're wanted in a small group session in the clinic down there, I, I think you'll find that is going to hit all sorts of roadblocks too. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think most of the stuff in the in the I'm, I'm going to call it just for just for shorthand third year. You know, during clerkship years is um, it's one of the reasons why the discussions have been that you know building building some time where students are together back here rather than you know having a you're right ship a biochemist. <laughs> Sorry, a ship of biochemists down to uh, no. Nashua. <laughs> you know, it's going to be. You know, I mean, it, yes, we. I mean, we have we have given some thought to that, and I, and I think there are I think there are ways of doing it that are somewhat more economical. Although you're right, I mean, it is going to what what we're thinking, what we're contemplating is somewhat more resource intensive. Can I? Um is this, are you hearing me? You hearing yeah. me? Uh, my name is John Heaney. I'm a retired urologist. And then uh, Corcoran very kindly mentioned Rich Freeman's name. And I see there's no surgeons other than the retired surgeons of John Saunders and Steve Plume on your list. So I'm retired as well. So just to respond right away, we do have a couple of surgeons on our list. The reason I took them off for this abbreviated list is because right now they're not working on our pilot design, which is what we're focusing on. But Horace is on our list. I've been in Dartmouth for 26 years and ran the section of urology for probably 18 or 20 of those uh, 26 years. I was not, I'm one of those people that Anne talks about as being faculty, but not a involved faculty for many, many years. The, during the very early part of my time here, I used to be on the SBM committees and I used to teach in the SBM. And then that became something that my junior faculty would participate in rather than myself. And over time, I became less and less involved. And much of that was due to pressure of patient load. And it was money. Because we were generating, we were the furnace, we were the furnace for the clinic. And if we didn't work, the clinic didn't make its bottom line. And I think monies are very important in this, uh, in this equation. And that's, very great, 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 I'm very happy to hear that you are now appropriately <coughs> remunerating people like Horace. I'm not sure that uh, there are people like Horace in uh, every section who can afford to take the time off uh, that Horace takes. But um, I, I'm a little bit disappointed that there aren't more surgeons in this room. I see one surgeon here, he's a retired surgeon also, and he's a researcher like I am. And um, 
He works in Thayer, but not and this is a secondary appointment at Geisel. And um, I would just remark that we are not involved. That's a, a an awesome point, and um, I, I think you've raised some of the reasons why there is less surgeon representation on this. And you know, and I think it's probably important to broaden this out to say that it's really important to the success of this process that we get real representation of all the different pieces of the community, surgeons, basic scientists, clinicians. We really don't want to leave people out, and sometimes there are these obstacles to, to getting involved. So I met with Rich about uh, 10 days ago, two weeks ago, and one of the key pieces of our agenda was me asking him for the names of surgeons whom I could approach to recruit more because we recognized that that was something we needed to fix. I do consider myself a piece of a surgeon. I spent uh, two years in a pediatric uh, surgery fellowship at Children's. Um, and this is something that we have discussed uh, constantly that we need to keep the surgical mindset in mind. I found myself when I was presenting the same patient with a congenital anomaly in surgery, presenting that patient very differently when I walked across the hall and worked with reproductive intercourse section. So I appreciate your remark and I do think we've, we've realized that this is an area that we, we definitely need to uh, keep focused on. Can I just get a quick show of hands of active clinicians in the room? So I guess I would expand your comment because I think it's, it's even beyond surgery and, and that um, dichotomy that Kathy highlights um, between educators and clinicians and being engaged as a whole, uh, I think the clinical faculty needs to be addressed. Danny, you're going to tell me to take a break again before you start talking. <laughs> you one, more? Yeah, one more, I promise, I promise you next time. I just want to say one more thing, and I'm sorry I took Horace's name. I took a bunch of names off because they're not actively engaged this fall. And one of the things that the students have really asked for is not only to be exposed to the patient center, medical home, and primary care settings in their early uh, clinical exposures, but also to surgical and other specialty settings. And so our hope is that come January, February, we're going to re-invite them into the process and they will be engaged. So believe me, we've been having many conversations with them. All right, Jess, you're on. <laughs> I am Jess. I'm a third year. Um, so I have a comment and a question, and my question is actually really easy, I promise. Um, and my comment would be just in terms of speaking about, you know, how to involve the clinical years in this redesign and all of that, I think it's extremely important. And I think it's also important not to lose sight of the logistics of being a Dartmouth student and how changing a lot of this will impact that. I think the third year at Dartmouth is particularly difficult for students because of how much travel we're expected to do. Um, and that's from many aspects, you know, just pure exhaustion to the financial aspects that are not necessarily well addressed in the current curriculum design. Um, and I think as we're thinking about pulling people back every now and then and things like that, we do need to consider, you know, just the the difficulty that that does present to students logistically because I think third year sucks <laughs> for a lot of reasons no matter what school you go to but I think that there are some special factors about the way that Dartmouth does things um, that may not really get the spotlight um, as often and that needs to be thought about in the redesign. Um, my question is, and you may have addressed can this. I ca the, can I comment to that one, though, before you do the question? Sure. I will promise you, did you see how everyone was laughing here? <laughs> twice a meeting, twice, maybe three times a meeting, I bring up this point. So I want you to know, at least, at least. oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. In the new redesign, not only will there be intercessions, but all four years will be here at those times, and they will be of length enough that we don't do exactly what you say. And believe me, they are so sick of me saying it that when you started talking, they started laughing. Just to get and, her to stop, we're going to do this. <laughs> right. But I mean, I think also just within the clerkships, you know, different clerkships do different things, and sometimes people bring, you know, like once a week, I think surgery comes back. If you're local for surgery, like people come to Concord for once a week didactics, and in Nashua, people have to come back, and all this stuff. And I think that that kind of thing yes. does need to be rethought, Absolutely. and not just the. the it, we've already the, decided we're not going to do it because I'm going to I'm going to so, over my dead body. Are we going to do that? Thank you, Anne. Um, and then my question is, and I was tardy, so it may have already been addressed in the introduction. Um, I've heard 
twitterings of, you know, that there's different pilots going on, and I know that the undoctoring pilot is going on, but I'm not sure what kind of information there is about the pilots and um, how that's being disseminated. Um, and I think that that would be useful to have a clear idea. Like, we all know that the first year's got iPads, but like, why? And like, what are you doing with the iPads? And what is going on with the undoctoring program? I think that, I think upperclassmen would like to know that information and that it's not being clearly communicated. So I did speak a little bit about the pilot in the beginning. I don't know whether you want to talk about other pilots I going on. Um, and I wish we had <coughs> Leslie here to talk about the iPad. Do you want to talk about that, Tim? You know more. Yeah. But is this, is this something that can be like put on the, put on the website, website or yeah, updated yeah. or something? Because I think the community yeah. in general hears about pilots and it's very big. That's just um, taking notes. Yeah. But, but to have a clear idea of what those pilots are and, mm -hmm. and you know, for students that are thinking about taking a year off or are you doing any piloting with a master's program, like things, things that students would be interested in getting involved in or just knowing more about, yeah. I think yeah, yeah. more Great communication. Idea. <coughs> There, there are a couple of things that are, uh, to some extent, uh, conflating, and um, for, for one of a better term, um, that, uh, for example, there's there's a lot of curricular innovations taking place this year, and if you talk to any of the first years, some of them are happier about it than others, uh, but um, you know, there's there's a lot of people trying trying different things than 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 has been the custom at, at Dartmouth before, and part of that. Part of that, uh, guys, old before, sorry, um, and part of that, part of that's because um, you know we are, as you probably know, um, in the middle of an LCME cycle here, and there are some things in the LCME mandates, and they really are that that are kind of driving some curricular innovations. But we're trying to do that in a in a conscious way that it might inform. You know things moving forward. So you can say, well, they're pilots. Well, you know, and they're not really pilots necessarily designed at, at the new curriculum, but but they're really targeted at improving what we've got now, in a in a way setting the groundwork for for maybe some some new curricular ideas. So so it's it's hard to it's hard to separate those two concepts in the in, in at least in the um, the core curriculum. And the other one, I'll give this to Tim, is that my group is, uh, if you want to call it a pilot, I, I, I don't actually like that word, but innovation that we're trying in terms of mentoring is the Connect Four program, which you're signed up for. And we will keep people that aren't involved informed, because I really didn't think about that. But the, the, uh, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, we have about 40 third and fourth year students, particularly some splits and some of the people here. Uh, students here are, are involved who will come back to, and work in Nance on doctoring with the facilitators as teaching assistants uh, for the year. I might just quickly say, you know, there has been a broad-based attempt to try new or innovative things, just like um, what Tim and I did for um, third years as they were going into their clerkship rotations to spend three hours talking about case studies in, in end-of-life care to begin um, that process, which had never been done before. So I think we're, many of our groups are trying different things. Maybe not all of them as dramatic as what Nan is doing, but uh, I think the rest of us are trying to seek out other ways to begin not only dealing with LCME issues, but also about innovations. About the um, iPad uh, question, or PC or question, um, so uh, just so everybody uh, knows, I mentioned this briefly at the beginning, all of the first year class were given uh, iPads. And although there was a little bit of basic software installed that was medical education specific, essentially this is, this is not sort of a, a finished, this is all you need sort of a product, but more of a, uh, it, Leslie calls this laying cable. This is sort of creating the infrastructure for innovations in medical education, knowing that there are going to be many participants in this that that select faculty members who are a little more technologically savvy may be able to sort of lead the way for the rest of us and how would we sort of use these tools. And also, as you know well, our students are incredibly technologically savvy and they help 
you know, pull us along by the lapels and sort of say, let me show you this cool thing. And they help generate that enthusiasm. And already we're seeing this foment of ideas between the, the, the faculty and students. Um, and the uh, expectation is that that uh, rolls out over time uh, uh, across multiple classes. Yeah, I think, I think it is important to keep the community updated on innovations in general, even if they're not necessarily related to the curriculum redesign, because, I mean, the, in, in some way this is about branding. And, you know, in order to get the entire community to buy into what we're doing, it's useful if we all have an idea of what's going on. And people are going to get excited about it if they know how to talk about it. And I think what's going on right now is that, you know, little things are happening, but nobody really knows, and so they don't, don't know how to talk about it. And it's just, any publicity is good publicity in some ways. And so being able to talk about these things, I think would be useful. It's a great idea, and, and just before we hit the next question, you know, Kathy's group has done a lot of work to create a communication system to help us communicate around these specific issues, but obviously that's building a communications infrastructure that works for all of us across a lot of different uh, issues, re redesign or not, and, and so I think that's going to be a service going forward. This has been um, most helpful. I think um, certainly I'll ask my partners at the table here um, who are part of pilots um, to get us a brief um, description if we don't have those now and put those right up on the website. Um, I would encourage everyone to visit the website um, as well as to um, reach out to us in the next month if you haven't heard um, from a communication curriculum liaison and there is one identified for each year of the students there's one identified for every um, group that we've identified as, as audiences for tier one which is including all basic science and alumni I mean pretty much anyone um, in the community is, is a tier one who has a representative um, for them I think um, you know how we can engage um, and communicate and again I'm, I'm speaking to the choir because you've all taken the time to come here but how do we reach out to those who didn't even open the survey um, or, or who aren't um, participatory and I think you know ideas I'm having here like maybe we need an iPad drawing at the end of a town hall something um, again to inspire and, 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 and re-engage people who probably want to be engaged but for whatever barriers over time um, have, have disengaged from the process and, and I think that will be our job going forward the more we communicate I think the more we communicate so just to say a couple quick things about how we're using the iPads and on doctoring and maybe Carl will want to chime in as well um, the Bates textbook of physical diagnosis which is what we've used traditionally here uh, which is a fairly heavy text that the students sometimes carry and often leave at home is now available on the iPad through Inkling and it has all it's really enhanced in the electronic forms it's got a lot of videos it's got a lot of cases we'll be using it to teach clinical reasoning it'll be very helpful in our on doc sessions to teach portions of the physical exam to enhance the videos that we've already made so it's really superb we're very excited by that the other thing that uh, we've all been introduced to, but we're kind of digital immigrants, so it may take us a while, is uh, something called Coach's Eye, which gives us the opportunity to literally film in real time, in small group, or in a clinical setting, assuming we get permission from the patients and students, interactions that we can then review later. We can analyze them, we can do it one-on-one -on -one with a student, we can do it in a small group, so Okay, that, I'm glad I didn't get an iPad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very exciting, Joe. Randy, one, say that. Okay. Any last questions? Yeah, Gene. Yeah, I, this is really very interesting and it's really great work. Have, have you spent equal time thinking about how we might stratify the students either before they get here or quickly after they get here? So the model is, um, this is not a model that you, this is the first model that comes to my mind, would be a liberal arts education where you have required courses and then you take a major. So what if we had a required set of courses that occurred early in year one? I don't know what they would be. You could decide about that. And then students would choose wh which direction they want to go. Do they want to be a specialist? Do they want to be a family practitioner? Uh, and that, that's it. You want to respond to that? Well, I thought you, I thought I thought Gene was asking a different question, so I am gonna I'm gonna leave that one to you. <laughs> I, I, I think the, the bottom line is that students change their mind all the way through yeah, their I medical education, that. so yeah. it's very hard to insist 
that they make that choice early on. In terms of choosing a master's versus not a master's, I don't think that we've decided exactly when that's going to happen, but it definitely will not happen as you start week one of medical school. It's something that will happen probably in the second year, maybe even later. But on the other hand, as the year one coordinator for a number of years, they take 12 courses, mm -hmm. and many of them don't like some of those courses. All of them don't like some of those courses. <laughs> <laughs> and many of them like some courses, some subset of courses. So pretty soon they've decided what they like after year one in terms of content. Now that, they may change their mind later on. They, they may say, okay, I'm gonna be a surgeon, I'm gonna be an internist. But is there some way we can facilitate or devote time to thinking how we might facilitate this sort of decision-making process to minimize the amount of time students <laughs> take courses that they're really not interested in. Well, I, I mean, one thing, one thing, Gene. I mean, we are charged by our accrediting yeah, bodies with with pr producing an undifferentiated physician who has the capability to 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 go into any specialty that they that they might choose to. Now, you're right. Some people have much more talent for one thing than another. I mean, I would have made a lousy surgeon. I'll tell you that. Um, so it's uh, um, so you know tracking people that way. I, I don't think we're going to really be able to. They also have to pass the boards, which means you know you do have to provide a broad general knowledge. Um, the question I thought you were going to ask is, you know, some people come in with a big difference in background and have trouble getting up to being equalized with everyone else. So they so they struggle often through the beginning of the curriculum. And I think I think there are definitely ways that we've considered to try to try to decrease that, um, uh, perhaps by allowing some individuals to move more quickly when they have, in areas that they have talent initially and, and, and background initially, and, and while others have to focus on, on um, different areas um, in order to get up to a certain level. I mean, that is something we have, ta have thought about. But as far as tracking individual specialties early, I don't think we've really considered that. Let me just say one thing, and then I know Anne's chomping at the bit. So one of the things that the longitudinal relationships with faculty mentors is going to provide is better advising, more continuity, getting to know the students in a much deeper way that will enable us, I think, to be much more effective at the advising and mentoring piece than we are currently. And we're doing a lot more of that than we were even two years ago. But I think there are going to be at least a couple of different sources of mentors. There'll be some in the basic science courses. There'll be some in the longitudinal clinical arena. So everybody will have at least two and likely more depending on their area of interest. Also, jump in before Anne's fighting at the bit. Um, I think one of the commitments that CHIP um, has and is very passionate about is, um, is the leadership curriculum. And I think when you ask the question of where is the process for exploring this going to happen, um, his, his um, curriculum um, and the leadership curriculum is committed to being comprehensive, but one component of it is the leadership of yourself. And I think in that um, curriculum, there's absolutely the opportunity to begin to do self-reflection and be exploring and self-awareness. So what are your strengths? What are your interests? What would you be good at? And I think that is a, a perfect um, area of content. And, and we've been working with Pino um, Audia at Tuck, who does a, an, an, an expanded course called Individual Leadership Now um, that has a lot of instruments, validated tools, and, and surveys that explore your own strengths. How much of that um, is generic versus we can tweak towards medicine, um, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's a, a potential place for us to explore it further. And we, the AAMC has spent tremendous resources on just what Kathy was talking about, and they have one of the best uh, career websites in the country. Uh, it has over, uh, I forget what it is, a half a million pages, three full-time uh, educational specialists run it. And they have tons of these different uh, tools and resources to help students, but they need what Nan mentioned. We do utilize it. In fact, the vast majority of our students uh, get on it before they even matriculate, and we push them to use it. And it's been a push in a way, but they have found it useful, and it has a lot more utility. They tell us, for the most part, and I could put you in charge uh, to contact with the lady that's done most of the tests, there is no way to accurately predict almost anything except the clinician scientist. You could predict them to some degree of accuracy. 
And, and just, just to play devil's advocate, you know, just because they don't like it or don't want to do it doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. And, you know, this is, this is you know, we're, we're, there, there are two different things that we're talking about in education now. One is we're dealing with the students more and more as our customer. We want them to be entertained. We want them to feel coddled. We want them, and, and, and I think that that is a laudable goal. But at the end of the day, uh, there are going to be lots of things that students need to do. I think we need to decide, not the students, what they need to learn. And then we find the best way to deliver those kinds of things. Because a student, let's say, and I'll just pick an example, that, that said, doesn't want to, to do surgery doesn't mean that there's no value in them taking those surgical rotations. Or you don't want to be a researcher and what's the value of me learning about metabolism, you know. Said, I mean, the, the, but, but, but the broad-based curriculum is that even if I'm not going to be a surgeon and, and I don't want to, to take that surgical rotation, and I don't have anything against surgery, by the way. This is just, you know, an example. Um, it is important that I understand what a surgeon does and understand the surgical mindset. And, and I think that, that, that I could substitute any of, another, any of a, a number of specialties and, 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 and curricular focus areas, you know, for that, that, in that same light. And so um, I agree with you. I think that it's important to try and help them guide what they're going on. But I don't think we should be afraid about, about you know, deciding what it takes to be a good physician because you know, it's, it's the slow path to ruin if students have complete control over their curriculum. I, I'm just not sure that that is the best way to go. They can't. They'll say me won't let it, but I will tell you the students do not want to be coddled. They want to leave here being the best physicians they can be with very few exceptions. That has not ever been something that I think is one of our big problems here. So this is great. You know, I think that there are easy questions as it relates to curriculum redesign. You know, who got an iPad the first year class? That's easy, right? <laughs> But 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 there's uh but there are these very difficult yeah there are these very uh, di I didn't get one uh, uh, very difficult uh, questions of, of balance um, and uh, and you know logistics and how and why and and, and hopefully this is uh, just one of many uh, conversations we have but the hour is late and I know I've got a, a list of things that I learned from tonight so I, I appreciate it and hope to hear from you some more thanks a lot.